My Intrinio guest today is Phil Vigo. He's a senior data engineer at Intrinio. Welcome to the podcast, Phil. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, can you start by telling everyone a little bit about your personal background and how you came to be at Intrinio? Sure. Uh, I've worked a number of different types of jobs uh, for, for many, many years. Um, I've been um, a rice field agricultural technician. I've worked in grocery stores, worked at a, a VHS video store when I was way younger. Um, and then and then got serious about my career, went to college and got some math and dropped out. And uh, I've been working with data pretty much ever since. Uh, I came to Intrenio uh, after a, a disaster hit my community and um, I was looking for a job. And uh, Intrenio looked like a really good opportunity. So I, I applied and now three, almost three years later, I'm here. You're here and you haven't quit. <laughs> and uh, could probably have a whole podcast just on your background, but uh, maybe tell us a little bit more about what it means to be a senior data engineer at Intrinio. Like, what type of things are you working on on a daily basis? Right. So, a lot of what I do requires a great deal of curiosity. I run into things I never see on a daily basis, and and the joke I used to make was that I, I basically get paid a lot of money to uh, play Sudoku all day. Um, but I think that I've got a better way to describe it now. Essentially, the work we do is if you were to have a library and you wanted a robot to read all the books and then tell you where he thinks or she thinks it should go onto a shelf, then it doesn't always get it right. So you have to train the robot to be able to shelve a book correctly. That's a lot of what I do, only abstract that into financial data. I, we get fundamentals in from a wide variety of sectors. Um, they all have their own way of doing things. The robot goes and tries to figure it out. It doesn't always get it right. Data quality engineers, we go through and try to make that better. Yeah. So you're training a machine to do the work because it probably scales a little better. Do you, do you have a name for this robot that's, that's, that you're helping? Well, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to use it because we, we, internally we, uh, we, we use like funny names for the different strategies and stuff. Um, so I'll just call it engine. I think that's what what, uh, what you know the engineers I, I work with would call it. Um, but uh, but yeah, it's just basically a, a, a very powerful system that has a, a wide variety of of different outlooks it would take to determine which one it should use to standardize the data. Right, and so the idea is that this you could have a whole bunch of. Uh, people who don't have a ton of skill go and shelve the books or you could have the robot do it and have a very small team with a lot of knowledge that works with the robot instead. Right. And, and what's great about our programmers is that they all, for the most part, know a bit about financial data before they got here. A lot of them trade in uh, themselves. They sell, they, they sell and trade stock. And so they, they understand the importance of why this data is so useful. And so they're really good at training the robots ahead of time before, you know, someone like me who, who actually knows very little about it. That's what's so amazing about it is, is that even though I'm not a financial person, I can still use what is left over and figure out what to do with it. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more in depth about why that data needs to be worked with between you know you're working a lot with financial statement data like why can't it just why can't people just go and get that data um native from the sec or in the in the wild why do we need to have this robot in between that makes that data more useful sure so uh, i mean all of this is publicly you know available information and and all of it is you know filed under xbrl code or experimental language. And, um, and so if you wanted to, you could go to the SEC and plug in a company one at a time, pull up every single filing one at a time, and it would take you, you know, forever to be able to pull that information down in a reasonable amount of time. And, and, and what we can do instead is, is we can pull all of that data and standardize it and put it into a, a format that's easily digestible so that somebody can compare apples to apples with seemingly unrelated companies in, in a matter of a simple query. Whereas if you were to just do it to the SEC, you probably have like 400 tabs open trying to figure out which one to go to. And, and I mean, and when you're thinking about trying to do this at scale, 
there's just no way to do that. I mean, you know, maybe you could go on, on someone's website and hope to God they've got it right. But, you know, it, it really isn't, you know, very easy to do without, you know, having someone come in, take the data, interpret it, and then put it into a standard form. And that's the other thing that's really great about what we do is, is that, you know, we have a couple of different templates we use to allow you to take something that would seemingly be unrelated from different sectors of you know, the market and, and be able to compare them on, on the same types of tags, like revenues and, and expenses, and, and you know, compare their fundamentals across to try to find patterns or you know, something so you can make a more intelligent you know, trade or, or, or you know, give it to a customer with your analysis. If you wanted to do it manually, take one company at a time, you're going to spend most of your research time standardization piece that having you and this robot in between um, makes it possible to just get so many more comparisons done almost to the level of automating analysis. Um, can you talk about some of the tougher companies to standardize? Like what's going on with some of these crazy filings and like what have you seen in the data? Yeah, a good example of a challenge is any company that uh, buys at a lot of other companies. So uh, think of think of like a, a energy company on the East Coast. Uh, they're all owned by like only a small handful of, of businesses. And whenever they buy a bunch of different companies, they have to file for all those companies. And all those other companies, mm -hmm. they have different fiscal years and they have different, you know, so what they do is they do what's called dimensionalization. And the dimensions that come out of that, they, they contribute to the overarching top line and bottom lines on all the different dif uh, filings that come through. And so keeping straight, like say you have an energy company that has 40 subsidiaries and they all have revenues and, and maybe like a couple of them matter to the overarching top line, keeping all that straight is very challenging. Um, and what's really cool about it, really, really cool about it is, is that we actually have some strategies now that are really good at taking the, the sort of like guidance we've given the robot and they can do it almost instantaneously now. It used to be something we'd be sitting there and just like picking at and trying to figure out and it's like, that hard work has now gone into making those robots more smart. Yeah. So these filings, they're a mess, I imagine, when and you're going in there, diving into the data and applying experience and not just fixing it for that one filing that one time. Does do you, When you go ahead and understand these statements and, and figure out how to standardize them, will they be mapped in the future to that standardized template? In the future and the past, we have the we have ways of, of basically taking anything that uh, the, the the system has struggled on in the past, and and we can run these strategies on them, and um, we can audit ones that are already you know standardized and see if we did them correctly. So we're constantly improving the data. We're constantly trying to find, you know, the cleanest, most useful, actionable data that you can get. Yeah. Um, and so anybody who's using that data is getting the benefit of having a, a team of data engineers um, always running their analysis off of. Um, what are you working on next? Like what is, um, what is, do you see as the next step to continuing to improve these data sets? Well, I'm working with uh, Jason on getting uh, the next, next level of the validator done. The validator is a program we use to uh, analyze the standardization to see if there's anything weird going on in the filing. Um, and so I've been working with him on strategies regarding that. And then from there, we're also looking at standardizing data for um, foreign markets um, using IFRS taxonomies. Uh, so anything that files in Europe or across you know, the world we're really excited about the possibility of getting into standardizing that data because it's a field we really haven't really dove into. So it's it's a really, really cool future. Yeah. So you could be expanding outside of the U.S. and using the same approach to standardize filings across the globe. Yep. I, um, I was thinking about that idea this morning and thinking how if, if you had standardized templates that went across countries, you could really open up the investable universe for folks so they could pick better investments regardless of the market. Whereas I think right now a lot of investors, their, their investable universe is limited because you don't have standardized data um, for Europe or Asia, for example. Yep, that's exactly right. And um, 
I mean, we've, uh, we've sort of staked our claim on, on U.S. companies specifically, but we've also more recently expanded into American uh, depository I, I, ADRs. I, I always forget what the R means, but you know what I mean. Just basically foreign filers who trade in the United States. Um, we, that's sort of like one of the basis for helping us get this off the ground because they do file things very differently than they do here. They still follow, you know, our regulations, but, you know, a German bank will often be very different than a U.S. bank. Right. Okay. So you're using the ADR information that we've been covering in the United States, taking some of that information and then expanding outwards. That, that's really cool. Um, do you enjoy working with all this data? I mean, you said it was like a puzzle for you. It's like, um, you know, it, does it keep your brain working all the time? The, the best answer to this is most of the time. Um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're a small company. We, we've, we've overcome a lot of really big challenges. Um, this isn't a simple problem to solve. And so, you know, you run into some things that make it a little more difficult. Um, but but overall, like when it when it's humming and I'm just like just solving these left and right or, or even better when I'm working with somebody um, who's dedicated to who understands this stuff really well, it can like take big wax at the, you know, at it. That that's that's the that's the best. Especially when we start to see like 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 the strategy we created this summer, um, the, the data quality, the leap it took was just immense. And um, that feels really, really satisfying, like, especially, you know, being here in almost three years, not quitting, um, you know, seeing how all this has happened over time has been incredibly, incredibly a part of. Yeah. That's good to hear that <laughs> you like it. And that <laughs> when you make, when you make progress, it's staying in your head against it. I like one of the, val the values that I think you really live out is work smarter, not harder, finding these solutions that can make a big impact. Um, it's really, really helpful. Can you tell us what you're doing for fun outside of work? I could ask you about music. I could ask you about com composition, video games, all kinds of things. I got uh, some new John Denver music that I didn't know about from you recently. What are you What are you into right now besides work? I uh, So my, my birthday is right around the corner, and um, I think that my family's gotten to the point where they don't really get me anything. They're just like, what's dad going to buy this year? Um, so this year I bought a, a, a keyboard and I'm, I'm learning piano right now. So that's been really fun. Um, I play guitar since I was 13. So I'm almost, you know, almost 30 years on the guitar, not quite that long. Uh, and now I'm expanding to the, the, the piano finally, because I mean, it was going to happen eventually. <laughs> what are you going to do with that, with your piano once you get good at it? Or do you, do you like to compose? Do you like to just learn songs and enjoy? Yeah, well, right now it's just learning basic, you know, technique. I, I, I don't really understand, like, my hands are killing me because I didn't realize, like, you hold them a certain way. And, I mean, I always could screw around on a piano, but, like, not not like I'm doing now. I actually have a book. It has notes. I have to, like, you know, this finger pushes that note, whatever. But but it also has, like, the, the one I got has the ability to help me compose, uh, like, demos. I don't have a band and, you know, in the age of COVID, I don't want to, like, find a bunch of people to get in a room together and, you know, breathe on each other. So the keyboard kind of has a way of allowing me to, like, put a beat down and then I can I can record a loop and then put it on my computer and, and edit it. And, you know, so, yeah, it's sort of, sort of like want to get into composition. And I, I used to do it when I was younger. And so it's just getting back into it. Yeah, well, I can't wait to hear what you compose and how you make progress on that and also what you come up with and compose for Intrinio um, on the data engineering front. Thanks so much for coming to the show, Phil. It was a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. It was, it was a pleasure.